Ruchem Aboim. Again, welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Um, again, we're in the middle of our um, Amida series. And um, again, a deeper understanding of what the Amida is saying. Again, this is a... So, this week on my thoughts, uh, we will continue our in-depth discussion of the Amida with the eighth blessing in the prayer. This is also the fourth of the personal requests that we offer to God uh, Almighty daily, except on the Shabbat and or the Yom Tovin. In this prayer, we request of God our Father in Heaven to refer Enu, which means to heal us, not only from our physical and emotional ailments, but in addition, from our spiritual challenges as well. You know, the Talmud and the Tractate of Megillah asks, why did the men of the Great Assembly establish the request for healing as the eighth blessing in the Amida? Well, they answer, since the ritual of circumcision, bris milah, is performed on a newborn baby boy on the eighth day after his birth. This then coincides with an operation which requires a refuah shalema, a complete healing, again, for the newborn infant. The Pirkei de Rebbe Lezer state that the covenant of our father Avraham, Abraham, was the eighth of the ten trials that Avraham was tested with, which established his loyalty to God Almighty. It was also the eighth commandment that he was commanded to observe. That was in addition to the seven Noahide laws that were given to all of mankind. The Medrash Rabbah states that the reason for waiting to perform a circumcision on the eighth day is that God Almighty had pity on the newborn child and waited until he had the strength. We know that nothing in this world is an accident. This statement, the strength of the child on the eighth day, can be understood in regard to the children's coagulation factors, which classic medical studies have discovered to be at their peak around the eighth day of a baby's life. This would then make the eighth day of a newborn boy's life, actually the most optimum time to perform this ritual. Our sages tell us that the number seven is connected to this physical world, whereas the number eight is connected to that which is above this physical world. This is the reason given as to why circumcision was introduced as the eighth commandment. Now the number eight reserves a special place in Judaism. We are commanded to place eight tzitzit, fringes, on the four corners of our garments. The Balaturim suggests that the eight strings serve as a sort of reminder that we must guard our souls from the eight parts of our body that promote our temptations and desires. They are our eyes, ears, nose, mouth, hands, feet, sexual organ, and our heart. In addition, the holiday of Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days. The holiday of Shavuot, the time that we accepted the Torah on Mount Sinai, began in the eighth week following the holiday of Pesach, Passover. Then after the seven days of Sukkot, we celebrate Shemini Atzeret, the eighth day of assembly. This is a special holiday where we dance with the Torah. The nation that Yehoshua Joshua circumcised before he, for entering the land of Israel was the eighth generation, counting from Abu Ravinu, who was the first person to perform this ritual. The Talmud and the Tractate of Baba Basra attributes the last eight verses written in the Torah that relate to the death of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, to Yehoshua. The longest psalm in Tehillim is, is Psalm 119. In this psalm, Dabar HaMalach began each chapter with one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and each chapter consists of eight verses. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, was required to wait, wear eight special garments whenever he would officiate in the temple service. An animal could not be brought up as a sacrifice <clears throat> until it was at least eight days old. In addition, King David was the eighth son that his mother bore to his father, Yishai. The ineffable name of God 
the holiest of his names, the name that we do not pronounce as it is written, what we refer to as Hashem or Adonai, his name of mercy, has a gematria, a numerical value of 26. Two plus six equals eight. It is not surprising that the gematria, <coughs> excuse me, the numerical value of the Hebrew word Torah, which is 611, 6 plus 1 plus 1, again, equals 8. It states in Barashas Rabbah that Rav Shimon Bar Yechoi said that the day of Shabbat came before God Almighty and said, Master of the universe, for each day of the week there is a partner. Monday has Tuesday. Pardon me, Sunday has Monday, Tuesday has Wednesday, Thursday has Friday. But I, I have no partner. God replied, the nation of Israel will be your partner. Therefore the Jewish nation became the eighth entity, the partner to the seventh entity, which is the Shabbat. The Marsha, based on the Talmud and the Tractate of Menachot, relates the story of Dovon Amalek. It says when he was one time naked in the bathhouse, he was thinking to himself that there was no mitzvah that he had ever performed in his life that did not contain some form of self and enrichment. But then David looked down at his circumcision and he was comforted. That was when he composed Psalm 12. So it opens up with the words, Lam Natseach al Hashminist, to him who causes victory because of the eighth. Now the number eight is connected with circumcision and healing, since we have a tradition that Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, is required to attend all circumcisions. Now as part of his mission, he is there to cure the baby from his operation. However, we do have a belief that while he cures the newborn child, he also has the permission to cure the illnesses of everyone who is intended. Our sages tell us that the baby's suffering for the sake of God Almighty arouses intense divine compassion, and as a result, God accepts all prayers and, peti and petitions favorably at this special time. The Rashba stated that even though a person should visit a doctor for medical treatment, he should nonetheless direct all of his hopes and prayers to his benevolent Father in Heaven. Doctors and medicine are really only the tools that God Almighty employs to bring about his cures. As Socrates was quoted as saying, that a doctor keeps a patient company while God Almighty performs his miracles. The prayer opens with the words, Enu Hashem Heal us, God, and we will be healed. Now the double term alludes to both curing from pre-existing ailments in addition to keeping us healthy. The Talmud and the Tractate of Shabbat teaches that a healthy person should always pray that he does not get sick, since once he is already infirm, it requires a much greater merit to regain his good health. Again, requesting God to move a pebble is much easier than asking him to move a boulder. The Torah states in the portion of Mishpatim that Rapo Yirape, that he shall surely heal. This is a double term. From these words, our sages instruct us that a doctor is permitted to administer medical treatment to a patient and that we are permitted to seek medical treatment from doctors. In addition, with human intervention, the Torah expresses a double term, reason being since there are times when a physician must repeat treatments due to human error or misjudgment. However, when the cure is administered by God Almighty himself, well, then only one term is mentioned since his diagnosis is always correct and his treatment is always successful. Rabbeinu Bachai states that when the Torah gives permission to a doctor to heal, it does so using the Hebrew letter pay, which has a harsh sound to it. This is alluded to by the dot in the letter pay. This suggests that medical procedures many times entails needles, scalpels, and treatments such as chemotherapy, which cause the patient pain.
pain and discomfort. However, when God Almighty heals, the letter Fe is used, which has a much softer sound. Since the cure that we receive from God is painless and permanent, no necessity for needles, scalpels, or painful treatments. Therefore, the Amida follows Yirmiyahu's plea in the book of Jeremiah, Rifa Enu, heal us, where he uses the softer, undoubted faith. The stipular Dgon interpreted this double term in just a little different way. He said, may God heal us from the doctors. He felt that one of the worst offenses committed by insensitive doctors who give up hope on their patients and fill their hearts with helplessness and depression. Doctors were given the right to cure a patient, not given the right to give up. You know, I had a dear friend who was diagnosed by a doctor and told that he had had only 20 months to live. Well, after the doctor informed him that his condition was hopeless, my friend stopped living. But then he went to see a specialist who told him that they would fight the cancer and that they would be successful. With these encouraging words, he got out of his self-imposed coffin and began to live life again, filled with hope. You know, he may not have survived any longer, but he did live those remaining days much fuller. The Mishnah in the Tractate of Kedushan states, Tov Shivarofim Ligehenim, that the best of the doctors go to purgatory. There, there are different explanations offered to this statement. One answer is that it is alluding to doctors that are so kind that they can't perform a painful procedure or, or an amputation. A doctor needs to have the strength of character to administer whatever treatment is necessary to save the life of their patient. Then there are physicians who see themselves as so great that they don't need to consult with anyone else. Their ego gets in the way. So they see themselves as Tov, the best doctor. They don't need to pray to God for his guidance. So they, so to speak, skip this blessing. That being the case, instead of reciting 18 blessings, they now only recite 17. 17, which is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word tov, which means good. You know, doctors have been known to say that they have done all that they can, and that now, now is in the hands of God. They fail to realize that it was and always is in the hands of God. The prayer continues with the words, Hoshi Enu Benivoshea, save us and we will be saved. These words allude to a spiritual salvation. You know, we have a belief that all physical ailments are only a physical manifestation of a spiritual deficiency brought about by our transgressions. The question that arises is, since our sickness is the will of God, well, how can we pray that he yields his will to ours? Now, the purpose of sickness and pain is to bring the person who is suffering to acknowledge that there is a God in the world and that we must serve him. Once we turn to him in prayer, well, there is no longer a necessity for the illness. There's a story told of a great rabbi who was ill, and he asked his student to make an appointment for him with a specialist. Well, the doctor examined the rabbi, and he prescribed medication for the rabbi to take. However, the student noticed that the rabbi never filled the prescription. So he asked his teacher, <coughs> excuse me, if you weren't going to take the medicine, then why did you go to the doctor? Well, the rabbi answered his student that the reason he went to the doctor was not for the medication. It was to pinpoint which part of his body was the cause of his discomfort. We have a belief, according to Kabbalah, that all of the 613 commandments in the Torah are connected in some way to different parts of our bodies. When we sin, we actually damage in some way that part of our body that is connected to that commandment. So he told the student that I was feeling a pain in my body, but I couldn't ascertain which sin I had committed that needed rectification. So I went to the doctor for that information, and then 
I was able to cure my body with the proper tshuva. So the double term alludes to the fact that just like the physical healing that God administers is permanent, so too the spiritual healing is also permanent. Which is why we continue with the words, Ki ato, For you are our praise. Now, I also see an allusion from the word Tehilosenu, that we should recite Tehilim, Psalms, whenever we beseech God Almighty for ourselves or others that are in need of a salvation. Then the prayer continues with the request for a complete cure, stating, that then grant us a complete recovery from all of our afflictions. So at this point in the prayer, it is permitted to add the names of those individuals that you know are in need of a speedy recovery. We first mentioned the sick person's Hebrew name, followed by the Hebrew name of their mother. We do not offer this request before God Almighty because we believe that we deserve that he should answer us. We submit our request before him only because we believe that ki kel melech rofe neamon barachmon arto. For you, Almighty King, are a faithful and merciful healer. The phrase ends with the word ato, you are. This is telling us that in the end, everything, everything in this world is in the hands of of God Almighty. The word Melech, which means king, rarely appears in the blessing of the Amida. It is stated here to emphasize the fact that though mankind is permitted to practice medicine, it is in reality God Almighty, our benevolent king who administers our cures. Huh, he doesn't need to practice. The Talmud in the Tractate of Shabbos teaches us that the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, rest at the head post of every sick person. This is one reason as to why we make it a point to not sit by the head of a sick person's bed. The Berke Yosef in Yerodea states that the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word Shechina, divinity of God, is 385, which is the same gematria. The numerical value is the words Rofe Chinam, which means he who heals for free. In addition, the numbers 3 plus 5 equals 8, which forms a number 8 two times. There is nothing that is more spiritual than the divinity of God. The prayer ends with the words, Blessed are you, Hashem, Rofe Chole Amo Yisroel. He who heals the sick of his people, Israel. You know, it's interesting that the blessing that we recite when we exit a restroom is Asher Yotzar Es Ha'adon which means he who has created mankind. Now, the Hebrew word Adam alludes only to a Jew, whereas the Hebrew word Ha'adam alludes to all of mankind, Jew and Gentile alike. This prayer concludes with the words, he who heals all flesh and acts wondrously, which includes all of humanity. Yet in the Amida, the prayer concludes with the words, he who heals the sickness of his people, Israel which only refers to the Jewish nation. So from these two prayers, we acknowledge that though God Almighty cares for all of his creation, still there is a special place in his heart for his firstborn child, Israel. We read in the portion of Eshala, where God states that if we do what is proper in his eyes, then he will not afflict us with those maladies that he brought upon the Egyptians. The verse ends with the words, for I am Hashem, your healer. This is the reason that in the Passover Haggadah, there is a debate among the rabbis as to how many plagues were brought upon the Egyptians in Egypt and how many at the sea. They increased the number so as to protect us from many of the maladies that exist in the world. The Tur in Orachayim notes that there are 27 words in this eighth book prayer. There are many references to the number 27 in the Torah. There are 27 words in the verse in the portion of Eshala where God promises to be the healer of the children of Israel. There are 27 verses in the portion of Lech Lecha that introduce 
the mitzvah of circumcision to Avram Avinu, to Abraham our father. The themes of healing and circumcision are intertwined. There are 27 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, 22 regular letters, and five letters that are used only at the end of a word. These serve as an illusion that if we follow the fundamentals of the Torah, well, then our flesh will be healed. In addition, it takes 27 days for the human body to regrow a human cell. And the name Adam, man, is found 27 times in the Torah. If we add the numbers 2 plus 7 together, they equal 9. The number 9, as I've mentioned many times before, alludes to truth. We need to know with complete certainty that the only true healer in the world is God Almighty, our benevolent Father in Heaven. So, let us pray that he brings a quick and decisive victory in Gaza with a complete defeat of Hamas and all the evil in the world. May he return all the hostages home safely, cure the sick and injured, comfort the mourners, and bring home all the brave IDF soldiers quickly, being led by Mashiach Sukhanah. Let it be now. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, hopefully we'll go back to the music in a, next week or the week after, whichever it will be. My uh, recording guy is out of town. <laughs> Anyways, please, uh, again, thank you for attending. Please push the uh, like button. Uh, if you haven't, please subscribe. And again, share, share with your friends. Hopefully they'll find it interesting and, and, and informative as well. And hopefully this is helping you to pray a little bit better than you were before. Or if not, making you think about praying now. God bless and be well. God should bless you with only good health safety and happiness. Again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.